The year is 1992, in the United States Penitentiary. Once powerful mafia boss found himself stripped of his former glory, John Gotti, known as the Teflon Don, during his reign as the boss of the Gambino crime family, now bore the weight of humiliation within the cold walls of his prison cell. The confines of the prison tormented him. It was the mockery and humiliation inflicted upon him by both fellow inmates and guards alike. Despite his attempts to maintain a facade of authority, Gotti found himself subjected to ridicule and scorn. A fellow prisoner physically assaulted Gotti severely, and he was bedridden for weeks, stripping away the aura of invincibility that once surrounded him. Even the guards, tasked with maintaining order within the prison, found amusement in his downfall, taking pleasure in humiliating him at every opportunity. Gotti's meals became a source of amusement for the guards. They delighted in tampering with his food, serving him inedible potions of food and laughing as he struggled to stomach the mockery laid before him. In the harsh reality of prison life, John Gotti found himself reduced to a mere shadow of his former self. Humiliated and scorned, he now faced the bitter truth of his own mortality, a stark reminder of the consequences of a life lived on the wrong side of the law. Conviction. In December 1990, something big went down at the Ravenite Social Club. FBI agents and NYPD detectives stormed in, making quite the scene. John Gotti, Salvatore the Bull Gravano, and Thomas Tommy Locasio was arrested. John Gotti was convicted in 1992 on charges of racketeering and five counts of murder, including the assassination of Paul Castellano, the boss of the Gambino crime family, in 1985. It didn't stop there. Gotti was accused of conspiracy to kill a man named Gaetano Corky Vastola, along with loan sharking and illegal gambling, obstruction of justice, bribery, and even tax evasion. But what really turned heads were those FBI bugs. The Federal Bureau of Investigation had been listening in, capturing conversations that would make your hair stand on end. When those tapes played at pre-trial hearings, it was like dropping a bomb. The Gambino family and the whole crew of Gotti got hit hard. The tapes by the FBI had created a divide between Gotti and Gravano, his right-hand man. Suddenly, trust was in short supply. Gotti started pointing fingers, accusing Gravano of being too greedy, maybe even trying to pin some murders on him to lighten his own load. It was like watching a house of cards tumble down. The once unbreakable bond between Gotti and Gravano was strained, if not shattered entirely. And as the trial loomed closer, tensions only grew. The stage was set for one of the most dramatic legal battles in New York's history. On one side, you had Gotti, fighting tooth and nail to stay on top. As the legal battle raged on, John Gotti's attempts to patch things up with Salvatore Gravano fell flat. Despite his efforts, Gravano grew disillusioned with the mob. He started doubting his chances of winning the case, especially without his trusted lawyer, Shargel, by his side. Feeling cornered and betrayed, Gravano made a decision that would rock the underworld. He decided to turn state's witness. It was a move nobody saw coming, least of all Gotti. On November 13, 1991, Gravano made it official. He was ready to testify against his former associates. It was a blow to the Gambino family, and to Gotti in particular. Gravano became the highest-ranking member of a New York crime family to become an informant since Joseph Messino in 2003. Meanwhile, the legal proceedings against Gotti and Thomas Lacasio were in full swing. The stakes were high, and Gotti's reputation for jury tampering didn't make things any easier. Jury selection began in January 1992 with an anonymous and fully sequestered jury, a precaution taken due to Gotti's notorious influence. When the trial finally kicked off on February 12, 1992, prosecutors Andrew Maloney and John Gleason came out swinging. They wasted no time in laying out their case, starting with those damning tapes. The recordings captured Gotti discussing Gambino family business, including murders he greenlit. It was chilling evidence, painting a vivid picture of Gotti's involvement in organized crime. They brought in an eyewitness to the hit on Gotti's former boss, Castellano. This eyewitness identified one of the triggermen, further tightening the noose around Gotti's neck. As the trial continued, Salvatore Gravano took the stand on March 2, 1992. His testimony was a turning point, confirming John Gotti's high-ranking position within the Gambino family and shedding light on the plot to take out Castellano. Gravano didn't hold back. He confessed to a shocking 19 murders, implicating Gotti in four of them. Despite efforts from Gotti's attorney, Albert Krieger, and Locasio's attorney, Anthony Cardinale, Gravano remained steadfast under cross-examination. With Gravano's testimony done, the government wrapped up its case on March 24, 1992. The defense had their chance to counter, but things didn't go as planned. Five of their six intended witnesses were deemed irrelevant, leaving Gotti's tax attorney, Murray Appleman, as the sole voice in his defense. As the trial neared its end, tensions boiled over. 
Gotti's hostility reached new heights. With outbursts and insults hurled across the courtroom, Judge Glasser had had enough, threatening to kick Gotti out if he didn't rein in his behavior. Despite the drama, the jury reached their verdict on April 2, 1992. Gotti was found guilty on all counts, while Locasio faced conviction on all but one charge. It was a devastating blow for Gotti, once hailed as the Teflon Don, for his ability to evade justice. The news reverberated far and wide. James Fox, assistant director in charge of the FBI's New York field office, declared at a press conference, the Teflon is gone, the Don is covered with Velcro, and all the charges stuck. It was a moment of triumph for law enforcement, signaling the end of an era in organized crime. But the final nail in the coffin came on June 23, 1992, when Judge Glasser handed down the sentence. Both Gotti and Locasio were condemned to spend the rest of their lives behind bars, without any chance of parole. Along with the life sentences came a hefty fine of 250,000 hours. And with that, the chapter on John Gotti's reign as the head of the Gambino Cream family came to a close. He son soon to chable status shattered. He now faced the harsh reality of life in prison. It was a reminder that no one, not even the most powerful mob boss, was above the law. Time in prison. In the somber corridors of the penitentiary, there was a new arrival who stirred quite a commotion among the inmates. This newcomer, the dapper Don, John Gotti, carried an aura of respect and admiration from the moment he stepped foot inside. It seemed as though his very presence commanded attention, and others flocked to him like moths to a flame. Gotti's arrival didn't go unnoticed. In fact, he was perceived almost like a celebrity among the inmates. They treated him with reverence, offering to do anything for him and expressing unwavering loyalty. It was as if he had some kind of invisible shield around him, protecting him from the harsh realities of prison life. But perhaps it was this sense of invulnerability that led Gotti down a dangerous path. He started to believe that the rules and consequences that applied to others didn't apply to him. It was as if he was above it all, untouchable in his celebrity status. Walter Johnson. However, Gotti's world was about to be shaken to its core. He encountered a formidable inmate, a black man named Walter Johnson, a man known for his explosive temper and physical prowess. Despite warnings from others, Gotti made a grave mistake by uttering a derogatory slur towards Johnson. The tension between the two men reached a boiling point one day on a narrow walkway. Words were exchanged, tempers flared, and before anyone could intervene, a physical altercation erupted. It was Johnson who made the first move, launching a brutal assault on Gotti. The sounds of fists pounding flesh echoed through the corridor as Johnson unleashed his fury upon Gotti. Blow after blow rained down on him, leaving him battered and bloodied. Gotti tried to defend himself, but it was no use against the sheer force of Johnson's aggression. In the midst of the chaos, Gotti sustained serious injuries. His head throbbed with pain, blood trickled down his face, and his body was covered in scratches from the ferocity of the attack. Meanwhile, other inmates who had witnessed the altercation opted to stay out of the fray, unwilling to risk getting caught in the crossfire, and the guards at the penitentiary just laughed off the incident. Despite his attempts to downplay the severity of his wounds, it was clear that Gotti had been significantly harmed in the altercation. The altercation served as a harsh reminder that even someone as seemingly untouchable as Gotti was not immune to the harsh realities of life behind bars. In USP Marion Penitentiary, strength and power ruled supreme, and Gotti had learned that lesson the hard way. As Gotti nursed his wounds and reflected on the events that had transpired, he realized the importance of keeping his mouth shut in such a volatile environment. No amount of celebrity status could protect him from the consequences of his actions, and he vowed to tread more carefully in the future, but Gotti didn't forget what Johnson did to him. As the dust settled after the fight between Gotti and Walter Johnson, the penitentiary buzzed with conflicting accounts of what had transpired. Gotti insisted that he had merely slipped and fallen during the confrontation. Aryan Brotherhood. But in the grounds of the prison yard, alliances were forged and destinies intertwined. In these grounds a figure loomed large, John Gotti, a man driven by a thirst for revenge and a hunger for power. It began with whispers and secret meetings, as Gotti brokered deals with some of the most notorious figures within the penitentiary. Among them were Barry Mills and Tyler Bingham, leaders of the infamous Aryan Brotherhood. These discussions hinted at potential business ventures, but there was something more sinister lurking beneath the surface. But as whispers turned into rumors, and rumors turned into reality, a darker truth emerged. Gotti's desires went beyond mere business dealings. He sought revenge, and he was willing to pay any price to see it through. In a bold move, Gotti approached Aryan Brotherhood chieftains, David Sahakian and Michael McElhenney, with an offer they couldn't refuse, somewhere between $40,000 and $400,000 to have Johnson eliminated. It was a brazen display of power, 
a testament to Gotti's determination to settle an old score. In August, McElhiney took matters into his own hands, instructing two Brotherhood underlings to carry out the hit if given the opportunity. Fate intervened abruptly, diverting Johnson's anticipated reckoning with Gotti as he was promptly relocated to the high security confines of the Supermax prison in Florence, Colorado, dismantling Gotti's vengeful aspirations. However, Johnson's propensity for disruption and menacing conduct towards staff persisted unchecked in the ensuing days, prompting authorities to take decisive action. Recognizing the urgency to contain the chaos he instigated, they opted to transfer him to an alternate unit, albeit as a temporary measure to mitigate the broader challenge he posed, acknowledging the complexity of managing such an individual within the prison system. However, Johnson's troubles didn't end with his transfer. Outside the walls of the prison, he continued down a path of violence and crime. His rap sheet grew longer with each passing day, with offenses ranging from assault to even more heinous crimes like killing law enforcement officers. It was clear that Johnson was no stranger to the criminal world. His history included a stint in prison for bank robbery, which had landed him in the federal system in the first place. But what truly set him apart was his exceptional physical strength and aggression, traits that made him a formidable adversary to both inmates and staff alike. Despite efforts to rein him in, Johnson proved to be uncontrollable. His violent behavior persisted, and it wasn't long before he found himself back behind bars once again. But even incarceration couldn't contain his rage for long. Upon his release, he wasted no time in returning to his old ways, committing further crimes that left a trail of devastation in his wake. But the situation in USP Marion changed. There were new alliances forged inside the penitentiary. There was a shift in the air, a change in the Aryan Brotherhood's approach to violence. Gone were the days of senseless brutality. Instead, they seemed to be focused on violence with a purpose, violence aimed at financial gain. And at the center of it all was Gotti, a man with a reputation for streetwise savvy and a knack for turning a profit. Gotti had brought his entrepreneurial spirit to the Aryan Brotherhood, transforming them from a mere gang into something more akin to a mafia family. As the dust settled on this chapter of Gotti's prison odyssey, Gotti's influence had sparked a transformation within the Aryan Brotherhood, a shift towards more calculated and strategic endeavors. The Aryan Brotherhood inside USP Marion went beyond a neo-Nazi prison gang and become an organized crime syndicate. As whispers of Gotti's alliance with the Aryan Brotherhood spread throughout the prison, so too did rumors of the Aryan Brotherhood's dominance in the world of drug trafficking. Some speculated that they controlled not just a significant portion, but possibly even 100% of the drug trade within the prison walls. It was a staggering claim that sent shockwaves through the legal systems of United States of America. The parallels between the Aryan Brotherhood and the infamous La Cosa Nostra could be seen as Aryan Brotherhood's control within the prison system to the workings of a well-oiled machine. It was a comparison that underscored the sheer level of influence and control wielded by the Aryan Brotherhood, both behind bars and beyond. There was symbiotic relationship between the Mafia and the Aryan Brotherhood even before Gotti. Favors were exchanged between the two entities, not just within the confines of the prison walls, but also in the outside world. It was a mutually beneficial arrangement that further solidified their grip on power. Prison Food As power and influence continued to unravel within the prison walls, a new development emerged, the introduction of premium meals in the USP Marion. These lavish dishes came with a hefty price tag, far beyond the means of most inmates. But for someone like John Gotti, who had the financial resources to indulge in such luxuries, it presented an opportunity too tempting to resist. With his sights set on one of these premium entrees, Gotti made his request known. It was a simple enough desire, but one that would soon prove to be more complicated than anticipated. You see, the premium meal required cooking in a microwave, and therein lay the challenge. The guards, you see, weren't obligated to cook meals for the inmates. It was a task that fell outside the scope of their duties, leaving Gotti in a precarious position. But undeterred by such obstacles, he pressed on, determined to satisfy his craving for culinary extravagance. And so, when Gotti approached the guard tasked with maintaining order within the prison, with his request, the response was initially one of reluctant to accept Gotti's wishes. The guard agreed to cook the meal for Gotti, but as Gotti walked away, the guard hatched a plan of his own. While Gotti waited eagerly for his meal to be prepared, the guard seized the opportunity to execute his scheme. To make fun of Gotti, he intentionally told the cook to overcook the premium entree, rendering it virtually inedible. It was a calculated move by the guard, designed to assert his authority and remind Gotti of his place within the prison hierarchy. When Gotti discovered the ruined meal, his frustration was palpable. He voiced his displeasure, perhaps expecting some form of restitution or apology. But instead, the guard's response was cold and dismissive. He simply instructed Gotti to get another one, 
callously brushing off his concerns as if they were inconsequential. And in that moment, Gotti came face to face with the harsh reality of life behind bars. Despite his wealth and influence on the streets, within the confines of the prison, he was just another number, subject to the whims of those in power. It was a sobering realization, one that served as a stark reminder of the true nature of his circumstances. Yet, despite the setback, Gotti remained undeterred. With a steely resolve, he set out to procure another premium meal, refusing to let the guard's actions dampen his arrogance. For in the unforgiving world of the prison, resilience was often the key to survival. The fan mails. Amidst the monotony of prison life, John Gotti found himself inundated with a deluge of fan mail. Each day, a duffel bag brimming with letters and packages would arrive at his doorstep, a testament to his notoriety both inside and outside the prison walls. Yet, despite the sheer volume of correspondence, Gotti rarely spared a glance at its contents. But while Gotti remained indifferent to the mountain of mail that accumulated in his cell, others were not so disinterested. Among them was a female co-worker of the guards, a recent addition to the prison staff. Armed with curiosity and a healthy dose of mischief, she took it upon herself to sift through Gotti's incoming mail, eager for a glimpse into the inner workings of his world. What she discovered within those envelopes was nothing short of astonishing. Mixed in among the mundane letters and well wishes were a plethora of risque photographs and bizarre missives from admirers far and wide. Some contained confessions of crimes committed by other inmates, while others were humorous applications for positions within the mafia, each more outrageous than the last. But perhaps most intriguing were the letters from women expressing their undying love for Gotti, accompanied by naked photographs intended to tantalize and entice. It was like seeing something really strange, like a glimpse into the weirdest parts of what people want deep down, where fantasies collided with reality in a whirlwind of emotion. As the guard's co-worker continued to pore over the contents of Gotti's mail, she couldn't help but marvel at the sheer audacity of some of the correspondents. With each letter she read, she gained new insight into the complex relationships and alliances that existed within the prison walls. Yet, despite her fascination, she knew that she couldn't possibly read every letter that arrived for Gotti. And so, she and her fellow guards devised a system. They would sift through the mail, distributing it among their relatives and friends, and continued to make fun of these mails. But as they sifted through the letters, a troubling thought began to gnaw at the back of their minds. What if some of the correspondence contained incriminating evidence? What if by turning a blind eye, they were unwittingly aiding and abetting criminal activity? The possibility weighed heavily on their conscience, and they toyed with the idea of alerting the authorities. After all, their duty as guards was to uphold the law, but ultimately, they decided against it, choosing instead to focus on their primary objective, maintaining order within the prison walls. And so, as the letters continued to pour in, they resigned themselves to the fact that some secrets were best left buried, even if it meant turning a blind eye to the truth. Death. In 1998, John Gotti received devastating news. He was diagnosed with throat cancer. This marked the beginning of a tumultuous journey for the once powerful mob boss. Determined to fight the disease, Gotti underwent surgery at the United States Medical Center for Federal Prisoners in Springfield, Missouri. Initially, there seemed to be hope as the tumor was successfully removed. However, fate had other plans. Just two years later, the cancer reared its ugly head once again, throwing Gotti into a whirlwind of despair. With his health rapidly deteriorating, he was transferred back to Medical Center for Federal Prisoners in Springfield, where he would spend the remainder of his days. Life in prison took its toll on Gotti, both physically and mentally. Gone were the days of power and influence. Now he was just another inmate battling a relentless illness. Despite the best efforts of medical professionals, there was little they could do to ease his suffering. As the days turned into weeks and the weeks into months, Gotti's condition continued to worsen. Then, on June 10, 2002, at the age of 61, he took his last breath. The once feared mob boss had succumbed to his illness, leaving behind a legacy tainted by violence and crime. In the aftermath of his death, Gotti's family faced another blow. The Catholic Diocese of Brooklyn refused to grant him a requiem mass, a final farewell according to their faith. It was a stark reminder of the repercussions of a life lived on the wrong side of the law. However, amidst the controversy, there was a glimmer of solace for Gotti's loved ones. Despite the diocese's decision, they were allowed to hold a memorial mass in his honor after his burial. It was a chance for family and friends to come together to remember the man behind the headlines. Flawed though, he may have been. The story of John Gotti serves as a cautionary tale, a reminder of the consequences of a life consumed by greed and power. In the end, not even the most feared mob boss could escape the grasp of mortality. And as his final chapter came to a close, Gotti left behind a complicated legacy.
one that continues to intrigue and fascinate to this day. Following John Gotti's passing, his funeral took place in a setting far removed from the grandeur he once commanded. Held in a non-church facility, it was a stark reminder of the downfall of a once powerful figure. Despite the absence of representatives from other New York City families, an estimated 300 onlookers trailed the procession that followed the service. As the mourners made their way, they passed by Gotti's Bergen Hunt and Fish Club, a place that had once been a hub of his operations. Now, it stood as a silent witness to the passing of an era. Gotti's body was laid to rest in a crypt next to his son, Frank, a poignant reminder of the family ties that endured even in death. However, not all who wished to pay their respects could do so. Gotti's brother, Peter, remained incarcerated, unable to bid a final farewell to his sibling. It was a bitter reminder of the consequences of their shared life of crime. The absence of representatives from other New York City families spoke volumes. It was seen as a repudiation of Gotti's leadership and legacy, a final judgment on his reign as the head of the Gambino crime family. The prosecutions triggered by Gotti's aggressive tactics had left the family in disarray. By the turn of the century, half of its made men found themselves behind bars, a testament to the dismantling of Gotti's empire. The funeral marked the end of an era, a somber acknowledgement of the consequences of a life lived on the wrong side of the law. Yet, amidst the grief and recriminations, there remained a glimmer of hope. For even in death, there was the possibility of redemption, a chance for those left behind to learn from the mistakes of the past and forge a new path forward.